Good evening, and it's talk time again. So, <clears throat> in the last episode, we talked a lot about wading and why that was going to be related to the tog work. Well, now it is going to become uh, clear because once more we're going to take a step in the tog saga, sort of. So, when we're breaking down such a long and complicated development process. I'm trying to pull out the little bits that we need so we can focus on some of the main elements in detail without getting sidetracked. So the first vehicle they develop is TOG-1. Now that's going to start in the spring but because the next step in that, that, that spring work does not come to fruition until the end of the year in the meantime, they had another project, and that's the TOG Amphibian. So we're going to talk about the TOG Amphibian, so that when we come in the next one to talk about the TOG 1, the work on the TOG Amphibian will not get in the way, so we can just work our way through TOG 1, uh, hopefully without too much uh, diversion. So the last video also conveniently related to my next book, which is on wading and waterproofing. So just as we went over last time, three basic methods for getting to shore. Floating, unloaded directly by a landing craft, or underwater. For the floating one, we can either boatify our tank or use a screen, the Straussler type screen. For the landing craft one, we still need some element of waterproofing unless you landed completely dry. And for the underwater one, the big issue was always going to be waterproofing. Now, <clears throat> just to be clear, the TOG work broke quite a few of these rules that we went over. If you're unclear on them, there is a link in the description below to that wading video. I suggest you watch that one. But just to be clear for the, the talk, we are not talking about some humongous floating warship size behemoth or floating TOG-1 or some rather stale TOG-2 Navy meme. If we want to go down the route of stupidly big and impractical floating British tanks, we would just go for the Wilt series of vehicles and maybe we'll do a, a video on the Wilts later on but those were giant vehicles on tracks to work on land and in the water and like a lot of these things they didn't either very well. We're also not talking about a boatified tank so as we covered in the wading video of the wading options the boatifying one is the one that perhaps appears to make the most sense and indeed the wilt vehicle went down that inherently buoyant route. We can contrast that failure of a huge boatified vehicle with the small and excuse me small inherently amphibious tanks like the A4. That vehicle was so small and light as to be virtually useless for anything other than as a marker boy. So, what do we have? Well, if we're going to boatify it, we either go big or we go tiny. Well, again, the TOG are going to do something a little bit different to any of that and not go to the boat route at all. Their work would later feed in on 1941 work from the Naval Land Warfare Equipment uh, Division to create what was a boat playing tank. Those were the AT series of tanks. And there is a nice link from the AT to the TOG work. Because those AT tanks, those later AT vehicles, yes, they were a failure. But they were constructed in part by the firm of Braithwaite's. Now, Braithwaite's were a firm making large water tanks. They would make both the modular sort that bolts together in sections, or the large welded type. So Braithwaite's, as a contractor, made a very good excuse me, made very good sense for someone making a boatified tank because they're used to welding in such a way as to keep water in. Well, keeping water in, keeping water out, the wall works both ways. They were the contractor eventually for the welded 
inner hull of TOG 2. That we'll have to wait for later, but that is a nice little aside for how all of these things touch on one another at some point. So let's think back one second to 1939. We have Britain with forces in the form of the British Expeditionary Force in France. We have a large and well-equipped French army. What do we need amphibious tanks for in 1939? There's simply no great need for an amphibious tank, let alone one capable of assaulting a contested foreshore and holding a beachhead. What amphibian work which had taken place by Britain before the war had focused if indeed that's even the right word, on very light tanks, like that A4, where the amphibian nature of them was for mobility around crossing rivers or other bodies of water, rather than a focus on attacking an emplaced enemy up a beach. So, the SVDC in October 1939 they get tasked with a special heavy tank. They go to France to look at the French fortress tanks. They're the preeminent world power uh, that they're going to have access to, uh, to look at fortress tanks. They get to work on the TOG-1, and with that, all that work underway in the spring, the results would come to fruition at the end of the year. In the meantime, we have this amphibian work, because now what we have created is we have this group of designers, engineers, specialists, uh, and inventive chaps to whom problems can be posed. And this lack of amphibious tank is going to be one of these problems. Now, as I said, little work had been done prior to the war on a normal sized tank for wading. In the early part of World War II, there was no need either. So, in May 1940, with the collapse of British and French resistance on the continent and a rapid retreat to the UK, there's now an obvious realisation that there's no footprint, no military footprint at all in France or Belgium, and with no ports to unload vehicles through, now any return to the continent is going to require an amphibious landing, and that's going to require tanks, because that's going to be the only way you're going to get a war effectively taken up by the army against an opponent. So now we're paying the price for not bothering to develop anything uh, or really do that experimental work needed in the preceding two decades. So we're in the middle of 1940. The British have a bloody nose. The decision is finally taken to pay some attention to the work on an amphibian tank. And that appears to be the result of General V.V. V. Pope as the primary originator of the demand for this kind of vehicle. So now we have a decision in hand, we have a realization and we have a geopolitical crisis on our hands. Britain is in a war, it is out of its depth, not to use a pun, and General Pope now wants an amphibious tank. So in July 1940, the first inquiry is made on Pope's behalf by Mr. Burton to Sir Albert Stern. So you can see we're six months into their TOG-1 work when they get this um, amphibious vehicle project. And the amphibious vehicle project didn't last very long for their involvement, so... Um, this is why we're doing it this way, so we don't break up the nice flow on top one. Burton inquires in July. He inquires again a week later on the 6th of August. And on the 9th of August, uh, Stern agrees to take up the task of examining an amphibious tank by him and his committee. To the extent that Stern would then meet with Mr. Hopkins from the NLE. These meetings and these letters, these promises by Stern, actually took place before Stern had discussed this formally with the committee. And that is because, at this time, this is still just an idea. 
This is a case of Pope telling Burton, this is what we want. Burton says, tells Stern, can you do it? And Stern is like, yes, we'll happily deal with it. What are the requirements? The first thing that you're going to need from your design team is, this is what we want the vehicle to do. Don't tell them what you want it to look like. Don't tell them how you want it to do it. Just tell them the basics of, we need vehicle X to do this task. And Stern didn't have that. So he hasn't met with the SVDC, the rest of the team, to discuss the project. And that's because he hasn't got these requirements. And this was going to be a continuous problem all throughout uh, both this work and a lot of other TOG work. is a lack of decision making to say, this is what we want. Final decision. Let's go for that. So Stern couldn't really discuss it with the rest of the SVDC. But I will have you remember that Mr. E.C. Pound was a naval contractor with the SVDC, if you think back to the episode on the makeup of the committee. And Mr. Pound was also a member of the NLE too. So here again is one of those little connections between the two uh, divisions. It would be an interesting thing to theorize on after the end of the TOG amphibian work, how much of that knowledge was retained by Mr. Uh, pound to take forward into those NLE uh, amphibians. Now, if that lack of decision making as to setting the criteria for what they want wasn't going to be uh, difficult enough, there was also a problem because Mr. Hopkins and Mr. Burton did not get on. Mr. Burton appears to be the one who was against it. And he actually, there's a quote where he says he's very much against having anything to do with Mr. Hopkins. And whether that's a personal rivalry, a professional rivalry, or he just doesn't think that that's uh, an inquiry sent to the right area, I don't know. But clearly, having departments not wanting to work with each other on such important projects is never going to be productive. So after agreeing to these requirements, the next meeting was on the 12th of August 1940. Here, Stern met with Mr. Burton, still hadn't met with the SVDC, but along with Mr. Burton came Professor Lindemann. And Professor Lindemann was Winston Churchill's chief scientific advisor. Here, Stern um, handed Burton a letter regarding the amphibious tank, setting a meeting for the 16th, so four days hence saying that they would make progress and this wasn't going to be a particularly difficult task in that sense. You know, he seems quite confident that they could achieve the requirements, although at the time he still did not have the specifications from which to do any work. So on the 12th of August, the SVDC finally got to meet after this. Finally got to meet, although... Mr. E.C. Pound wasn't present at that meeting. The minutes do not record him present at that meeting, which seems less than optimal. Here, they got to discuss Mr. Ricardo's idea for a submersible tank. Now, the SBDC hadn't already met by this point. This was their first meeting on this project. Stern had only agreed to this originally on the last day of July. So in just 13 days... Ricardo suddenly has this idea for a submersible tank, which means either Mr. Ricardo already had this idea and it was sat in his notebook, or he came up with it on the fly, or far more likely, in those intervening uh, days, Stern had discussed the problem with Ricardo and they'd started to flesh out some ideas. I would assume that the last option there is the most likely because that would account for why Stern is so confident talking to Burton on the 12th that uh, he feels they can get these uh, excuse me get the amphibious tank um, idea off the ground in other words he said yes we can do it he's gone to see Mr. Ricardo and Mr. Ricardo said yep but it's going to be done this way uh, and it will work and Stern has quite rightly said yep okay and he's taken that back so They've got that. They've got 
they've got the nutshell of what they want to do. And Stern, for his part, wants specifications from Mr. Hopkins for a floating tank. So Stern might have got this idea from Ricardo, might have been on board, again, excuse the pun, uh, with this submersible tank idea. But at the same time, he's also wanting to know what the specification, specifications would be for a floating tank. This way, if you're armed with all the information, you can weigh up the options and you can make a good decision about what type of vehicle you're going to pick. As an urgent matter, however, regardless of what method was going to be chosen by them, the most important things to get done were practical landing tests of a tank on a foreshore. These were going to be urgently required and a tank was going to have to be chosen for that purpose. The real good news for the team is that at the same time, we now finally get the specifications through General Pope, excuse me, from General Pope for what was going to be needed. So specification 1A for this amphibious tank. It was to land on a beach and form a bridgehead three to five miles deep. It was to be launchable 200 yards from the beach and navigated below the water line. It should either use dead reckoning or something like the gyro compass used on the Touch Panzer. There's actually a funny comment in the in the papers saying it doesn't have to be a fancy device, something from Woolworths would do. You know, 200 yards isn't going to be something particularly complicated to navigate through. In fact, a gyro compass almost seems like it's over-engineered. The uh, Touch Panzer and even the Duplex Drive Shermans even had a gyro compass for, um, for that purpose. So land on a beach, form a bridgehead, 200 yards from the beach, navigate below. Or it was to fit tracks and armour to a boat with seagoing powers but limited cross-country performance. And that would could be considered. Now let's project a year ahead and have a look at that AT1, AT1 star, AT12 star. That's what that is. Armour and tracks to a boat with seagoing power, limited cross-country performance. Right. That second option, the um, trackified, shall we say tankified boat option, instead of a boatified tank, the second option is a tankified boat. Numbers of this vehicle must be available by the 1st of April 1941. So they're already in 1940. They've got less than a year to come up with the design, test the design, get it into production and have it in the hands of the army because the army is now wanting these amphibious tanks by April Fool's Day 1941. Other than that, the actual requirements on the vehicle are relatively modest, frankly. Armour, for example, even though some part of this amphibian work is going to be an opposed beachhead, the armour at a minimum must only be proof against small arms fire all round a point blank and only against the German 37mm anti-tank gun at normal impact, so that's 90 degrees as opposed to an angle, so normal impact um, at 300 yards from the front. And that's it. Um, that obviously isn't a great deal of armour, and that's going to help ideas for an inherently buoyant vehicle. As an armament, it's even less impressively selected as an armament. This is going to be the same again. A single two-pounder gun, a single coaxial Beza 7.92mm machine gun. No hull machine gun. So just primary gun, coaxial machine gun. That's all the requirement. And in fact, it was only supposed to have a crew of three, commander, gunner, and driver. Those are the requirements. Relatively modest. Okay, so the initial requirements there don't seem particularly onerous. We have two options. We have the submersible tank option and we have the tankified boat option. The requirements for armour are relatively modest. The requirement for armament is very modest. 
spot, the hardest part, specifically identified by Stern and Ricardo as the most difficult part of the requirements is speed and performance. So the performance on land was supposed to be eight to 10 miles an hour. Now that does not seem particularly fast until you consider what we talked about in the last episode with regard, we have to displace a certain amount of water to hold up a certain mass of boat tank. When it is floating, the more stuff we have on, as in the more suspension units, the bigger the engine, the more weight it has, it's gonna make the design a lot more complicated. It's also supposed to be able to do four knots in calm water. That's pretty fast for a tankified boat, boatified tank. Gap crossing. The vehicle needed to be able to cross a gap five foot six wide and be able to climb a step three foot high. Perhaps more difficult than any of that and perhaps a little underappreciated at the time was that this was supposed to be able to cross a single, a shingle beach. So shingle small stones. So it's got to be able to drive up that shingle beach effectively without bellying out. On the other hand, the vehicle only has to have a circuit range of 50 miles. Remember, it only has to make that relatively short beachhead. So boat to shore, beach, beachhead, 10 miles of operation, circuit range 50 miles. Seemed a little more than required, really. But that was the requirements, 50 miles. Uh, the only other two things to mention in its requirements are needed a number 11 wireless set or an equivalent plus an inter troop set and climate wise it had to be a suitable for use in both european and tropical conditions and by tropical that not just meaning far east they're also talking about middle east as well So there, through August, they have their idea for what they need to do, either under the water or floating. They have their specifications, and now they're thinking through the real-term consequences of how those specifications form into a vehicle for use in real life. And to meet specifications 1A, on the 19th of August, SVDC comes out with some, let's say, uh, lessons, learning a preliminary outline for their design. The logic behind the design is that they want the vehicle to be immune from enemy fire from the shore and aircraft en route. Obviously the vehicle is going to be light, it's going to have thin armour, and aircraft strafing your tank at sea will sink it. There is no possible way that they were going to be able to put enough armour on the roof to protect from that. Also, shore guns would rip it to bits. So, as small and light as possible will make the vehicle a small target and also make it easier to produce. In order to facilitate production, this vehicle is going to use as many off-the-shelf components as possible, and that is especially true with regard to the... So, on the 19th of August, 1940, in order to meet specifications 1A, this new tank must be ready for action as soon as it emerges onto the beach. It must be immune from fire by shore guns and aircraft en route, and it must be as small as possible, as well as being easy to produce, using features already in production, like an engine and other component parts. Ships carrying these vehicles should be as big as possible to carry as many tanks as possible, so the small size of the tank helps. And a ship with perhaps a draft of 18 to 20 feet, or even 25 feet would suffice. Although, because you're going to be dropping onto a shallow shelving beach, this deeper drafted ship would mean you're going to now need 600 yards of travel instead of about 200. The specifications also made it clear that a minimum of 2.5 inches of armour were going to be needed on the front of the tank and on near vertical faces, with 2 inches acceptable on sloped faces. The side plates would need to be 7 eighths of an inch thick to protect from armour piercing bullets, the roof, belly, and rear plates could be substantially thinner, just three-eighths to a third of an inch thick. And when it came to the turret, obviously it's going to need that two-pounder and a coaxial baser. It needs the capacity to take a turret of a turret diameter of four foot six inches and weighing three and three-quarter tons. 
to improve clearance on soft ground, that uh, shingle beaches rather, the belly clearance was going to be 15 inches. Using 18 inch wide tracks, the loading was going to be six pounds per square inch with six inches of sinkage. Dimensions of the vehicle, overall this was going to be 18 foot nine long, seven foot nine wide, and a height, not including the turret, of three feet. Yes, three feet. This was a very low tank. All told, the total weight of the vehicle was going to be about 14 tonnes. So if we subtract the three and three quarter tonnes of the turret from the total weight, the entire hull, fighting area and engine was going to weigh ten and a quarter tonnes. As to the debate over whether to float your tank or to submerge it, submerging made you immune to enemy fire. In fact, you'd be invisible to enemy aircraft, it was calculated, for two-thirds of the journey. So, 600 yards uh, total journey, but 400 yards of invisibility. You would have to be ready for action as soon as it reached the shore. Again, that's no different to a floating vehicle. But the method of propulsion that they were looking at for the vehicle should be the same on land as it was going to be in the water, i.e. it's going to have to be track-driven rather than dependence on just jet propulsion. Overall, it was clear, and they state this categorically, that it was to use a well-tried and conventional form of tank. So, not an existing tank, but a well-tried and conventional form of tank. So this isn't going to be something outlandish. It's going to be very standard, albeit kind of squash, pancake looking. When it came to thinking about the floating tank, the problem was, quote, a conspicuous and easy target. Yes, this thing is going to be bobbing around in the water. It's going to be easy to pick off. A small and compact tank would also mean low buoyancy. Add to that the th three plus ton turret, you're going to be creating a high center of gravity. Thus, you'd have to add large pontoons, adding weight and bulk. Those would then have to be removed on land for action. Not to mention the fact that now you've nearly tripled the width of your vehicle and taken away space for other amphibious tanks. Floating the vehicle, the tank could be propelled by the tracks as paddles, which makes steering easier, or with an additional propeller and rudder. Buoyancy would be increased if the top of the track was above the water level, although additional gearing and new driving techniques would create some issues, but quite honestly I think they were maybe overthinking that. A floating tank would, however, suffer in the event of a slight, slight sea swell, making the transition from water to land extremely difficult. For example, at high speed, the water swell would help push the tank up onto the beach, out of the water. However, at four knots, it's just not going to work like that, and as the tide or wave comes back, there's going to be a force acting on the vehicle, pulling it away from the sea, uh, excuse me, away from the beach, which it's going to have to counteract. In order to float, it's going to require 200 cubic feet of buoyancy, and to provide that level of buoyancy meant pontoons 4 feet in diameter and 16 feet long. That's 150 cubic feet. Like that, the vehicle would float only with the turret above the water, which meant the track tops would be below the waterline, so a propeller and rudder were needed. With these pontoons made of light metal, they'd be easy to puncture, and the loss of one pontoon could mean the capsizing of the vehicle. The size of the pontoons and additional resistance would also mean that that four knots demanded was going to be highly improbable. It was not going to be reachable using that method without some substantial development change. However, the tank would provide a natural buoyancy of eight and a half tons. So to float, it would only need an additional seven tons of buoyancy, and that would provide a 10% margin of safety. Assuming a maximum depth of water, of just 25 feet for the launching, travelling up to 600 yards and 400, to 400 of which would be completely submerged. A speed of float of 3 knots was more likely instead of the 4, but the speed on the bottom was going to be 5 and maybe even 6 knots without difficulty. And here's a quote for you. It says, It is clear that whether floating or submerged, the interior of the tank will have to be hermetically sealed. We need not, however, in either case, be very meticulous about this. For the time element is so short, in the case of the floating tank, it will be about five minutes, and in the case of the submerged tank, about three minutes. In the latter case, 
though the head of water is much greater, we could afford correspondingly more leaks since the time will be shorter, and therefore the loss of buoyancy is of no importance. In any case, a small bilge pump of the gear type would be fitted capable of dealing with, say, 30 gallons per minute against a head of 25 feet. Regardless, then, of whether the vehicle was going to float or submerge, there were some other issues to address, first and foremost being the air for the engine. So whether floating or submerged, the air intakes and outlets for cooling would have to be closed, meaning that the radiators would be out of action for the journey. That means the engine was going to have to be one suitable for working at a high temperature. Seawater, for example, is not suitable for use in cooling. Cooling could, however, be done by means of a heat interchanger, working alongside a radiator. The radiator would retain the fresh water system, dumping heat into the heat interchanger, which would then dump that into the cold seawater. When submerged, the heat interchanger was the primary means of dispensing heat, and the waste heat would go into the water, whereas on the land, with the air intakes open, the radiator would do, would do the work instead. In terms of exhaust from the engine, this posed no issue at all, even under 20 feet of water, except that there was question over the invisibility of the vehicle, as in, if it wasn't vented directly to the surface, raising bubbles from the exhaust system could give away the position of the vehicle. So if that wasn't essential, then the SVDC proposed a 2-inch diameter length of canvas hose, or like a fire hose, could be used to float on the surface and vent the gas. Once ashore, this would simply flop down, it would get hot, and it would just burn off and be left and the tank would go on its merry way. For the crew, there would be two options. The first was the use of a 3-inch diameter pipe, quote, like a submarine telescopic pipe. This would be attached from the top of the conning tower, or you could use compressed air. A compressed air would ensure visibility because there'd be no periscope poking out above the surface. On the other hand, underwater propulsion would require some additional engine power. So, to achieve 5 knots up a 1 in 75 gradient underwater meant an extra 50 horsepower was needed. A petrol engine burns 1.3 cubic feet of free air per horsepower per minute, and therefore with just 3 minutes submerged time it would need 200 cubic feet of air, or just one cubic foot of air at 200 atmospheres of pressure, in compressed air cylinders. Two cylinders of compressed air could therefore be provided quite easily, each containing two cubic feet of air, providing an air safety margin of 4 to 1. The estimate as well of six pounds per square inch of track loading was also improved when they considered the tank driving on this surface of, uh, excuse me, driving on the seabed. Because not only is there now inherent buoyancy of the vehicle, but that inherent buoyancy reduces the track load. In fact, that track load of six pounds per square inch reduces to just two and a half pounds per square inch when under the water. If anything, however, the main argument against a submerged tank was that if it breaks down, the crew would have little chance of escape. Quote, the whole operation is necessarily a hazardous one, and I suggest that the crew run less risk when submerged and invisible than when exposed to enemy action afloat or ashore. Now, navigation we know is going to be difficult, but the beaches were well charted. They could avoid uh, natural obstacles. As for enemy obstacles, those are going to be unlikely to be required. And honestly, if it breaks down, they already had escape methods for escaping from submarines in deeper water, there's nothing to stop the use of underwater tank escape apparatus being used to allow the crew to get out. So I, I personally believe that this emphasis on the crew having little chance of escape, but still on the basis of it being proportionally a lower risk, is somewhat overblown. I think they were over-concerned about it. The last comment regarding driving underwater was back to the engine issue. So... They need an engine which is in current production, and they need 0.5 horsepower per ton at the sprockets for every mile an hour to be achieved. Therefore, at 14 tons total weight and 10 miles an hour total performance, they need 70 horsepower. This is a very simple way of showing how 
oversimplified people's views of dividing weight by engine power can be. Because here they make clear that the mechanical transmission is the problem. Because the mechanical transmission, even at 80% efficiency, wastes power. So the horsepower required to take 14 tons to 10 miles an hour is not 70 horsepower, but is 87 and a half horsepower. Therefore, they need something 87 and a half or greater already in production. And the suggestion was to use the Ford V8 or the Vauxhall engine in the Bedford truck. Both of those vehicles could run on 67 octane pool petrol. Both could deliver 90 brake horsepower. And really importantly, both could also use their normal gearboxes and clutches, so there was no problem in both manufacture and supply. Of the two of them, however, despite both of them providing a torque range of about 7 to 1, which is more than adequate for 10 miles an hour, the Ford engine was determined to be more suitable for use because the overall length was slightly shorter. So that outline was sent in on the 19th of August and on the 3rd of September Sir George Gator, the minister, and Mr Burton and Mr Stern had a, excuse me, Sir Albert Stern had a meeting and the third item on that agenda was the amphibious tank. Burton asked Stern to make a working model of the amphibious tank and Stern offered to work with Mr Hopkins but once more, Mr. Burton was unhappy. He did not want any work done with Mr. Hopkins, as he did not want research interfering with production. Now, that's as much as he says about the issue. We know there was some other issue beforehand because he didn't want to work with him. And here we have a, a hint as to why. And it does strongly suggest that Stern's team weren't being tasked with doing any research here. They have the design, it's off the shelf components. And he seems overly concerned perhaps that Mr. Hopkins was going to want to do far too much research and not enough actual building to get this done. Now, the only other thing of note at that meeting was that this is the same meeting where Stern revealed that General Pope had asked the team to work on a flying tank. And perhaps in our later video, we'll talk about the flying tog as well. But please do not think of some giant tog too with wings. But um, yes, a flying, flying tank as well. How exciting. So... They come up with the idea, they've come up with their proposal, they've taken it to um, the minister, the minister's been thinking about it. Next step, uh, 6th of October 1940. By this time, TOG 1 has already been built and is performing very well. The SVDC members are over the moon at their success. What they've achieved has been phenomenal. And on that time, uh, excuse me, on that date, the 6th of October, a letter arrives from Mr. Hopkins, which is read to the team, uh, includes the t specifications for the amphibious tank uh, and formally requests some further consideration uh, from them. By the end of the month, Harry Ricardo is hard at work and has submitted his thoughts on the amphibious tank as well. And now we have Ricardo and Hopkins butting heads. Ricardo is clearly of the opinion that this submerged tank is very much the better idea and Hopkins is not sold on it. Hopkins wants a floating machine and perhaps the 81 star saga from 1941 shows that perhaps overall Ricardo was in fact correct or at least at the worst both of them were wrong but the 81 was not a success and the, this vehicle uh, that vehicle at least got further than this one did. The primary purpose, though, of the tank, as determined on the 21st of October 1940 between uh, Ricardo and Hopkins, was that according to Ricardo, the tank had to be very good on land and at the same time 
the whole issue of crossing a, the sea or crossing a river rather was very minor it's a very small part of the life of the tank so the tank should be mostly tank with some ability rather than a giant boatified tank tankified boat of relatively limited land ability and it's hard to argue that he'd be incorrect there especially when you consider something like an 81 in 1941 he did however agree with mr hopkins that if it was submersible the tank should be as small as possible well he already knew that and to, to be fair it's hard to get much smaller than a vehicle with a hull height of three feet in ricardo's view an amphibious landing of tanks should be done with as many machines as possible at the same time and small tanks simply meant more tanks could be carried on those ships and he made that point quite forcefully at the time all the armor from the design again had to be focused on the front and the angle of climb up the shelving beach meant that the turret provided a good deal had to provide a good deal of depression as well so as the tank comes up if uh, if your tank has a maximum depression of say uh, minus five but your tank is you know on a 10 degree incline suddenly you don't have any gun depression so it has to have really good gun depression and it means a clear field of fire so no stupid mini turrets no raised blob for the driver's head presumably you know the driver's just gonna have to fit in there somewhere uh, so it doesn't get in the way of the the gun and more importantly no giant raised front track run no big horns like you have on the churchill or even on the um, tog one something like that which would get in the way of the field of fire that wasn't a particular problem as they'd only required three foot of step climbing but had the army required a higher degree of step climbing as we covered in a previous episode about what that means for the shape of the front of the tank this would have had a seriously detrimental effect on the um ability of the gun to depress so ricardo uh, knew all of this he's come up with the, the whole idea he's come up with a suitable answer and he suggested the ford v8 or even the uh, Vauxhall bedford engine and that if the army did want a larger machine that it should carry more offensive armament so he's holding out the whole idea of well we've made it as small as possible but if you want it to be bigger I can make it bigger, but you're going to need to stick more guns in it because a you know, two-pounder and a single machine gun hardly seemed suitable. The other issue being production. So Ricardo's other sales pitch, I guess, for his idea was that because his submersible tank was much more conventional, it would have a much lower production time and cost and burden. So uh, once more, he appears to have been correct on that. Mr. Ricardo at the time actually quoted, it is quotable because he's been talking about um, this small life element of the tank being in water saying i cannot help feeling that he presumably mr hopkins is making rather heavy weather of these since when all is said and done its seafaring forms only the briefest of episodes in its career as a fighting machine so mr ricardo just was completely unsold on a lot of mr hopkins questions he did however take time to go through a lot of the good and bad points of the design and in that letter to mr hopkins uh, we have another small insight into some of the thought behind this svdc amphibian specifically blindness that whole invisibility immunity from fire is more important than armor Beach selection was just as equally important whether you're floating or driving on the seafloor. In terms of slowness, a gangway or ramp from the vessel could easily discharge tanks into 30 feet of water quite quickly. In terms of engine flooding, Mr. Ricardo saw no issues at all with the engine flooding as a result of the exhaust underwater. A simple two-way valve was in common use on something like submarine and he 
bloody knew that because he designed engines for submarines. So this was not a difficult issue for him, thinking of ways of using a combustion engine underwater, for goodness sake. In terms of soft mud under the water, obviously, as we covered, the ground pressure underwater was incredibly low. And the submerged tank had less ground pressure than the floating tank at the beach margins, which is the most difficult transition, as already identified. And if the beach really was that bad, so much soft mud, that it was going to be unsuitable for an attack anyway. So again, he wasn't sold on that issue. As for the issue of fighting while submerged, any complaint from Mr. Hopkins that the submerged tank couldn't fight is completely true. It is absolutely true that while submerged under 25 foot of water, this tank was not going to be able to attack the enemy. It also couldn't be attacked in return. And let's think, the eventual DD tanks, they couldn't fight when floating either, because to fire the main gun would not only have removed the waterproofing over the end of the barrel, it would have also blown off the front of the damn screen uh, and precipitated a rather quick trip to the bottom. In fact, those DD tanks could not uh, fire back until they were uh, landed on the shore, and as I previously said, drop the front screen and then uh, crack on. So really, why that was even a vague issue is is beyond me. Add to the fact of just how accurate were they really thinking fire from a tank bobbing around in the water was going to be anyway. At best for that sort of issue, the machine gun would be more of a spray optimistically in the vague direction of the enemy, whilst they, in return, get very carefully from a non-bobbing bunker to shoot back at you. I know which way I would rather be. When it came to the issue of underwater obstacles, obviously there's a concern about large rocks. If your tank is underwater and it meets one of these rocks and it's not going anywhere, it's going to be difficult to recover you. But large rocks are already known and charted, and Mr. Ricardo was very clear on that. And he saw very little chance of the enemy using deep water obstacles anyway. Plus, you could use a the driver to steer around them, as if you could at least see them, and in that depth of water a spot lamp would suffice. As for the small size, Mr Hopkins wanting a bigger machine, once more Mr Ricardo emphasised that a small machine was a virtue rather than an, as an uh, than a vice. Ricardo further suggested amending the SVDC idea for the original submersible tank by dropping all ideas of the periscope completely, not even making it an option. So that's it for now. I do apologize that there isn't a picture of the TOG amphibian. If you really are intrigued by the whole idea, you have my description uh, right there. I will even post all of the summary of those stats in the chat box below. I'll also include a link in that to my article on the TOG amphibian for Tanks Encyclopedia to have a look at. But maybe if you uh, spend some time thinking about the issues. You can probably see why they picked a vehicle the way they did. I think that this TOG amphibian is a really great example of just how much knowledge and how deeply this team really thought about not only the safety of the people using their vehicles, but also the production of them, as well as the, the utility of them in combat. See here, they've gone way beyond that simple firepower, mobility, uh, protection uh, shtick. Here they're really into crew safety uh, and utility. So you cannot argue that the SVDC um, were sort of your know, fly-by-nights here coming up with some random ideas. This is a very well thought out idea. Uh, in fact, substantially better maybe than the experts at the time. Uh, with their tankified boat might be considering. If you do uh, fancy taking this further, I am perfectly happy to entertain your ideas for what this vehicle may have looked like. Again, the, the stats will be in the chat box. Feel free to um, post a link to any of your artwork for it. You never know if it's great. I might find something to send you. I'm sure I've got something here of interest. Um, so let me know. Now, if you like this video or any of the other ones on the TOG or any other issues, then please like, share and subscribe.
If you wish to support me, my work, my research, my, my books, any further, I would ask you very kindly, please, to consider a donation through Patreon, as that will be needed for a large project, which I will tell you about to come to fruition next year. I'll leave that as a surprise for people, uh, for which the Patreon will be uh, much needed. And in the meantime, please feel free, please follow me on Facebook, FWD Publishing, um, WordPress, and on my Amazon author page. I thank you very much, have a good night, and we'll catch back up again where we hit off with TOG1. Thank you.